Hello, and welcome to um, the Institute for Security, Technology, and Society's first talk of the fall term. I'm Denise Anthony. I'm the director of ISTS, and I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, today, we are um, very excited to have Stephen Davis with us. Um, he is the CEO of IT Global Security. Global Secure, Secure, sorry. That's happened many times. Um, which is described as a boutique security engineering firm focused on computer game and gaming industries. Um, some of you might know Mr. Davis from his blog called playnoevil.com, um, which is really fun even if you're not somebody who does gaming at all. So if you're just interested in uh, security issues or uh, privacy and those kind of issues, it's, it's a pretty interesting blog to take a look at. He's also the author of the book um, Protecting Games, which is about uh, computer game security um, and online gaming. And today he's going to talk to us a little bit about computer security in the gaming world and the implications not only for the gaming world but for research opportunities or for those of us who want to think about computer security um, in general. So join me in welcoming Stephen Davis. Thank you. Uh, just actually to clarify, uh, how many of you are graduate students or people in the field? Yeah, I met you all earlier. Uh, how many people are interested in computer security as a potential field, I guess, an undergraduate of some sort? One. We'll have to talk later. May not be a good idea. Uh, and uh, people just interested in games or just generally interested or wanted some free food. A couple more and many quiet folk. All right. Uh, I started actually as a math major. Um, I'm old enough that when, when I started, there really wasn't much in the way of academic computer security. There was a little bit uh, here and there kind of doing formal security stuff and the odd cryptographer. Uh, so it's actually been a huge change in this industry. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, when I got started moving from straight IT security, which I started out at NSA uh, doing uh, security for nuclear command and control and key management systems. Uh, and miscellaneous other things that I can't talk about anymore. Uh, I moved on to uh, work for the, uh, as a contractor uh, with the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Aviation Administration, DOD, and other folks, both in the commercial and government sector. Uh, starting in the mid-90s, I got interested in game security. And to show how long ago this was, the motivation was there was one of these shows on Nova or Frontline or something about this wacky new thing called the internet. And uh, in this wacky new thing called the internet, people gambled online. And I was sitting there minding my own business, ignoring the thing mostly. And then someone said, there's no way to protect against, games, uh, against cheating in online games. And as a security person who'd been working in the field already around 10 years, that kind of caught my eye because it didn't seem to be quite right. And so I was a security guy for a little bit and created some security protocols for fighting cheating. And um, I was like, what the heck do I do with these? I'm a government contractor, I have no idea. And someone said, oh, you should file patents. A topic for another day as to the advisability of that and uh, financial rewards. You'll note I'm here. Uh, anyways, so I filed the patents and eventually got the patents. But I started looking at that time because, you know, if I'm going to file patents, I should learn a little bit about the industry. Um, what was going on in the game industry? And it was pretty interesting. I mean, people were already playing games online, not just poker and gambling games, but, you know, there was MUDs and some of the early graphical MMOs. Uh, there was piracy problems. There were all these kind of interesting problems. And as a security person who had been working in the government space for a long time. These were really interesting problems because they weren't government security problems. It wasn't about, uh, you know, whether people had the right security clearances and for if you're old enough, Bell LaPagula access control kind of stuff. None of that. It was cheating and piracy and that sounded kind of fun. And apparently a couple of you agreed, so you showed up here today. Um, so anyways, that got me into the industry and got me learning about this and it sort of 
changed my career in a radical, unplanned way. Probably an important lesson for us all and who, people who think they can plan their careers. And there we go. So why should you care about the entertainment industry? First of all, it's a really big industry with a lot of interesting problems. Uh, the gambling industry alone in the United States, when I last looked at it, was the casino industry over 50 billion a year. That's billion. Uh, I haven't looked at lotteries in a long time, but the lottery business worldwide in 2000, when I last found an easy number, was $120 billion um, for printing little pieces of paper. Uh, uh, and then you've got uh, all sorts of other things going on. You've got the computer game industry and, uh, and all sorts of other stuff. So there's a lot, of, and, and then the entertainment industry, uh, the movie and music industry with their well-known problems with piracy, which is closely tied to the game industry. Oh, by the way, please ask questions as we go along. I have no commitment to getting through every slide here. And so if we wander off on some topics that I'm not talking, hadn't planned to talk about, that doesn't bother me. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and if there's anything you want to talk about that I don't seem to be getting to, please ask. Um, but getting back to the talk here, security is a direct bottom line issue for these guys. After all, piracy, as we well know in the music and, and movie industry, is a direct bottom line in this issue. Uh, it's also true for the game industry. Cheating is a real direct issue in, in, in gaming. So these issues aren't abstract, um, and I know there aren't a lot of practitioners out there, but it's really hard arguing, if you can imagine, between whether sh someone should use Firewall 1 or Firewall 2 or, or these kind of strange, abstract you know, products that cost a different amount of money with different length feature sets. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of hard to get people interested or excited about that. The game industry, at least to my initial view, is really exciting because it's a bottom line issue. Um, also, for this group, why should you care about uh, the, the entertainment industry is, uh, well, they might be able to pay for you to do some research, but uh, it's really important to look at specific vertical markets for security. Too often we think about security in sort of high level, key management, encryption, access control, the real nuts and bolts of where security problems are and interesting security problems are and interesting security opportunities are, are deep in the specifics of individual businesses. And it's much easier to talk to someone about their security problems in their own problem space. Uh, you know, I don't have to, it doesn't take long for someone to understand what I'm talking about, what are the impacts of piracy on, a, on, on, a, on, on music or something. Security, after all, really doesn't exist in the abstract. I mean, uh, it, it only exists in, in the context of a business or a mission or a university here. Uh, after all, Dartmouth has its reputation to protect. It's an academic institution. Its currency is the education it provides and the research it does. And those are the things that it has to protect. Um, if I can create myself a degree from Dartmouth by hacking into your computer and save myself some very large sum of money. Um, that would be bad for Dartmouth's bottom line. It would be bad for Dartmouth's reputation and uh, I'd probably get in trouble if I got caught. Um, but it, but the, those are the security problems that are interesting. They're, they're specific. They're problems unique to education. There's problems unique, you know, when I worked in the Defense Department, uh, they were unique there. Uh, but that's where the interesting problems are. And it's interesting also going in and talking to people about what their business is and see, seeing where the security problems and opportunities are. Um, however, even though this is not a bottom line issue, and I'll say this surprised me, probably my naivete in youth, still youth a little bit, is that even though security, privacy, piracy, and all of those things are bottom line issues in this industry, they are reluctant to spend money on security. Uh, People, it's, it's just not fun. And it's hard to get everybody, anyone to spend money on security. It was hard actually in the defense department when we had laws that were requiring us to do it to spend money on security as I think the other folks who worked in that world can attest. Um, so uh, it's not unique in that regard. It was a little more frustrating than I thought when I showed spreadsheets of bottom line things that it was like, yeah, go away. But that's okay. 
Um, it's also nice to learn things. And um, if you read my book or my blog until very recently, I've been brutally hard on digital rights management. I assume everybody knows digital rights management from its reputation with movies and music particularly, but also with games. And um, I've wrote, written at length about how awful I think digital rights management is I, and, and that it's almost a fraud on its customers. Um, and recently I learned something, and I actually learned something from a digital rights management company, which was interesting. Uh, they were giving me a presentation on behalf of another customer, and way down in the like 10th or 12th slide, about four bullets from the bottom was, by the way, we had a return on investment of several thousand percent when we, when we used our digital rights management system as a sales tool. And I looked at that and I said, this should be the first bullet on slide one. Uh, you're not a technology company. In this case, you, you know, you've changed in a moment my view on uh, the, the world of piracy and digital rights management. Uh, this is probably gonna get me hate mail if this is videoed. <laughs> But anyways, uh, I will, I'll take that risk, which is because what they said was, what, we, what they did was they, they had their anti-piracy stuff and they said it worked. And because I'm a polite person, I said, okay. But then they said, well, it works, the way it worked was when you ran into our digital rights management system and it decided you didn't have authorization for this uh, game that you were playing, uh, it said, would you like to buy it? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, now, if you've talked to or seen what the game industry does, typically when someone's found to have a pirated copy of the game is they ban you, they knock you out, uh, or they make the game play really badly. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but what none of that does is it doesn't make you any more money. And allegedly, while we're, why we're in the entertainment industry is to make money, uh, in most businesses, to make money. So what was really kind of fun about this was they basically took these people, or as I've started calling them, the informal distribution channel, and these informal distribution people were buying so many copies that based upon how much money the DRM guys were making, they, they saw these huge returns on investment. And I'm like, okay, well, now what we've done is we've turned piracy in an, into an alternate distribution system for which we don't have to pay packaging costs because we're not printing DVDs or CDs. We don't have to you know, do boxes. We don't have to share any money with retailers. The only person we have to negotiate with is the DRM provider for our revenue split. And I said, this, is, this actually changes my view of it. It also harmonizes the economic incentives of the security company with their customer. Now, if you know, you probably don't know anything about the way the DRM business works, but the way they've historically charged is on like either a per title basis. In other words, you know, the game or the, or the, or the movie or whatever is, is being protected, a fixed price for that, or a fixed price per copy, like between five and 50 cents per copy, uh, or on a price per activation, you know, basically which ones are, are activated. And then sometimes they'll throw in some wrinkles. If our DM get, gets busted, we, you, know, you stop getting to, having to pay us. And it's like, well, the problem with all of these is you're actually getting paid for the people who bought the product legitimately. You're not getting paid at all for the pirates. And therefore, you're really not making me any more money, you know, unless you really believe that pirates who get stopped will then turn around and buy the, the game and the very little data on this, and there is a teeny little bit of informal data, is that as between one and five copies per thousand pirated copies convert to legitimate sales via, you know, sort of just stopping the bad guys. But this view obviously changed it, and of course, it's like, duh, this has turned the, the, the pirated copy of the game into a demo, right? That you basically run the game to the point where the, the piracy protection says, you know, you're a bad person, uh, and then it says politely, would you like to buy a copy of the game? And people who are like, oh, I was just about to do something really cool or made some progress in the game, have then decide, uh, yes, I'm invested in the game. Was that a hand raise or a stretch? Stretch, yawn of boredom, okay. Anyway, so um, 
the, 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 the incentives now are perfectly harmonized between the security uh, party and the customer. And after all, if the DRM system doesn't work, um, the people can continue to play the pirated version. Uh, if the game's unpopular, no one, no one buys it. Is that a hand raise? Yes. Sure, because I, uh, sure, sure, I will take that seriously. <laughs> uh, I've been against DRM because, first of all, they're not being paid to do their job, which is secure the product. They're being paid whether the product is secured or not, usually. Uh, two, from a serious technical point of view, uh, the game or, or movie or what it is, it has to exist in its entirety on my media for me to be able to play it, right? And uh, so it's kind of a misuse of cryptography and other security techniques to say we're doing something strong here. Um, so in a security purist academic way, I don't like it because they're saying, well, we're using cryptography to protect your game and they really aren't. So it offends my purist security sensibilities. Uh, and then it wasn't actually solving any problem. It wasn't making me more money, which is kind of why we're here to begin with. So. Um, uh, and often the guys didn't actually know what they were doing. I mean, I talk to these people, I look at their technology, and uh, it's voodoo in many cases. Um, so did you have to, I, I thought you had to read a comment about what they had to do to use your experience. No, I don't care about the experience of the user of the game, <laughs> except for whether they're gonna buy the game or not. Uh, I mean, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be unpopular. The only reason, game companies care about the negative experience with DRM is if you don't buy the game or don't buy another game. Now, the recent experience with Ubisoft and their continuous connection stuff, which they seem to have dropped or pulled back from, seem to get people at least publicly, the guys who write blogs from, uh, and, and articles on game sites from saying they wouldn't buy the game. If people don't buy the game, they care. If you cost customer service, which these guys make really difficult to get to, um, all of them, everybody in the computer industry, much less the computer game industry, um, they care. If they get paid, they're happy, right? So my user experience, I mean, the user experience <laughs> argument is really you've already made the commitment to the product by, time, by the time you run into any DRM system. So, um, and you kind of knew what you're getting into if you're buying a game anyhow, so, from a terribly cynical business point of view, it doesn't matter. Well, that's precisely the point. I still blame you uh, about the time they started speaking their racist and pure terms. I, I was blaming the internal DSMS uh, in and of itself. I do not want uh, a reverse disclosure in there, uh, and so I still have Okay, how many other people did not buy a game because they were concerned about a rootkit? Two, in uh, three, <laughs> out of four out of a room of uh, 20, 20, 20, let's call it 20 people, uh, of a highly academic motivated environment. How much effect do you think this has on the general public? Probably about four sales. I, look, the, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, uh, if, we, if we go back in time with history, Ubisoft was very aggressive with their use of Star Force, which actually had a worse reputation. They kept using it for years until basically beaten out of, the, uh, beaten out of that by a huge hue and cry from the, the press, not from customers. Uh, you know, uh, the industry sadly does not spend a lot of, this is not a customer care industry. Uh, it's interesting because I also work with the casino industry, some totally different view, they care about the customer, but that's because they have a commodity product. So that's my, does that answer your question on DRM? Um, yeah, because they don't care. <laughs> um, I, I guess you'll quote me on that. Um, but, the, the, but, but now we've got a, a different case where the DRM is actually acting as a gateway for a demo. And of course, the way they've used, they also used it in a very negative way. They made the experience unpleasant. The gameplay was de degraded. Uh, if there was anything that had gone wrong, the burden is all on the consumer. The consumer has a negative experience. Now we turn it into a sales opportunity. And it's like, okay, we've now got, at least from the two business guys, harmonization of stuff. So I actually have changed my tune on that, and it's nice getting surprised once in a while.
So this is, I, down in the subtitles, my security rant. And this is the advantage, I guess, being a little old. I get to talk about things the way I want to talk about them. Uh, there's no such thing as being secure, right? Security is always a trade-off. It's a choice between doing something and doing something else. The other, something else may be nothing. It is sometimes legitimate to do nothing. Uh, there was once upon a time a, a book called Information Protection and Other Unnatural Acts, uh, which is sadly out of print. But uh, the, the author used the word, he, he said he used the word protection instead of security because it gave the sense of, of you weren't in the state of protection, you weren't in the state of being secure, you were protected and it was imperfect. We live in an imperfect world, there is nothing I can do to make you totally secure. Um, I'll say this, my next thing, which is a, I think is a, a truism, which is if it's not simple, it's not secure. Anything complicated uh, and not understandable by a person almost certainly can be attacked. Uh, bad guys are smart. <laughs> hackers are, you know, we have these mythical views of hackers as very clever people. Most of the time they aren't. They're just a little more motivated than us. Um, but the key is to make the bad guy work not just a lot, a heck of a lot harder than you. Uh, and, and preferably something that he can't do. I mean, this is why we like cryptography, because you need PhDs in mathematics and lots of computers to engage in the debate at all. Uh, software security doesn't work almost. Uh, interestingly, the, 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 the DRM guys have asserted, and I'll choose to believe them because they're putting their money where their mouth is now, that uh, when they were using this approach, they were getting a lot, they were making more money and their customers were making more money. And these, are, and these DRM systems are pretty much pure software security systems. So what they did was they found a way to implement software, implement the security stuff in software in such a way that is much harder to break than it is to put in. And that's all they have to do. And remember, you're competing with a $50 purchase price, which is not much here, but it's more in Eastern Europe or China or Korea where there's a lot of piracy problems. But these guys are doing well, good enough. They've created high enough of a barrier. Um, I get this one, and this is just a pet peeve since I'm a crypto guy. Encryption is math, not security. A lot of people confuse the two. And uh, it matters. It's a business problem, not a technology issue. I'm sometimes frustrated that the security people sit under the CIO, usually, or as a technical thing, and that it lives mostly in the computer science department, with I guess a couple of exceptions. I mean, to me, it really should live in the business department, um, uh, or the economics department, or somewhere else, because it's really a strategy business problem. Um, uh, when I left NSA, when I was young and foolish and rather aggressive, I wrote this long classified missive saying why I thought NSA was going off the rails. And one of the things I said was we should fire the mathematicians and hire some economists. Uh, a statement that I said, and it was probably 90, again, 91, 92, and I pretty much stand by to this day, uh, which is the, because we don't understand how to make business trade-offs in security. We are bad at it. And I said, I was really good, because I'm a pretty good speaker, at convincing people to do security things that I thought they should do rhetorically. Did I have much engineering merit to this? Absolutely not, except for my belief and training and you know, culture of security that I had. This was not engineering, it was rhetoric and, 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 and personality and charisma, um, which as an engineer is a little frustrating, and in this case really is, I think, more a matter of economics. Um, so, I mean, again, I'm talking a little bit about security in general, one of the most important security principles is independence, multiple independent measures. People sometimes talk about layers of security, but this often gets turned into um, putting like encryption at a lower layer and access, you know, an, a, sort of a layered model like a rainbow. But it really isn't, it's much more like a mesh. You want your security systems to be meshed together and intertwined so that if one breaks, the system still holds. And we, we really rarely design that way. Uh, if you have a serial link, if you have serial layers, uh, you have a weakest link problem. Um, this was really depressing. I gave this talk, or a variant on this talk, 
a little bit over a year ago at Microsoft, and I said, okay, the cuckoo's egg, and it's out of print now, was probably one of the first big books in computer security. Has anybody heard of it, read it? And my sadness continues. Please find this book. But even for people who've read it, I don't think we think too much about, the, I mean, because it's a great story about hatching hackers in Germany, KGB, blah, 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 Defense Department computer break-ins. The most important lesson in that book actually happens on page one or right up front, which is Cliff Stahl, the author of the book, um, is asked to find a discrepancy between a weird proprietary Berkeley uh, accounting system and the, the standard Unix one that, uh, it was a couple cents a dime, something ridiculous, but he was asked to find this discrepancy. And the whole book takes off from there and is a fun read and was actually made into a Nova special. So I, you know, watch it if you don't want to read it. Um, but the importance there was two independent systems. And this lesson is totally lost on the security in, in, uh, community, it seems to me to be to this day, which is independent systems. We talk about audit trails, but they are in fact accounting trails. Uh, the discrepancy, the fact that two independent systems didn't line up was the key to that whole story. And um, it is a lesson that we continue to not learn to this day. Uh, so anyways, ooh, next part of the rant. Lazy, cheap, or stupid, and or stupid. Okay, as an engineer, you often learn the phrase good, cheap, and fast, you can have two. Um, I tried to come up with a security analog of that, and it's lazy, cheap, and or stupid, at least one will get you. Um, the effectiveness of security people is actually often pretty impressive. You can go walk into uh, a meeting with a customer, and within 15 minutes, you can start rattling off problems that go, uh, yep, uh, yep. Uh, and it's not because we are brilliant people uh, or wizards or magic or have some access to arcane knowledge. It's because we have rudimentary, rudimentary psychological knowledge of the way people build systems and behave. And people are really lazy. Uh, they will, you know, if, if, if they're building an, on, uh, an access control system, they will build it with a hardwired password, I promise you. Uh, uh, if there is a free library, even though that it hasn't been patched, they will not get the newer one. And occasionally they actually do stupid things, but mostly it's lazy and cheap. Uh, in the game industry, uh, one of my favorite comic example is the uh, PSP handheld from Sony. Um, has been attacked repeatedly and for years uh, based upon a flaw in the um, one of the graphics file format readers. You basically corrupt a graphics file, it causes the machine to get into a operating system state and you own the computer and you can play with all your pirated games. As far as I can tell, they've never fixed this problem because they continue to have problems with this, this graphics file format and, then, and that attack has served as the basis for many of the attacks going forward on it. What they've done continuously is patch and repatch and overpatch the operating system to try to stop the various attacks as opposed to looking at the root, root problem. Now I may not be correct on this, Sony has not chosen to share the details of what's gone on there. Um, but uh, if you look at uh, the problems in computer games in terms of cheating and stuff, you'll note cheating and, and piracy and all this has been around since people first played games. Uh, if you think about even card games, we have rituals that are security rituals that we don't even think about. We, uh, and if you go to a casino, dealers always have, either have bare arms or those little things to keep their wrists up. Well, why is that? So you can't put stuff up your sleeve, right? It's a security ritual. Why do we cut cards? It's a security ritual. Um, uh, so we create these security rituals. I, I, we forgot why we've created them at this point. But in the computer games, we know we have cheating. I've written for five years on my blog about very straightforward problems and why they, why they occur. I talk to at conferences to people in industry. They all nod their head yes. I read about you know, the latest games out, and I get a little tired of reading cheating problems with game X based on, you know, you know, and you look at it, and it's a problem that's been out there for years. MMOs have problems with gold farming. They've had problems with gold farming for 
years and years and years now, no one does anything about it. People are lazy, especially if they're making good money. General security strategies. Um, if you're in the computer security world, you hear the protect, detect, react magic triangle. Um, it's a rather defense department centric thing and we need to actually get out of it. Um, I like adding some others. Avoid, <laughs> avoid the problem, don't deal with it, ignore it as uh, you know, it's okay to not spend money on a problem. Deter people, scare them in a way without actually solving things or make people believe that they will be caught uh, and that they can be credibly caught. Um, if you look at the game space uh, you, if, and you follow it at all, you hear about banning. That's all you hear about if you talk, hear about security. People cheat, they get banned. They pirate a game, they get banned. It kind of gets really boring and, it, uh, and from my view it's totally stupid because it's not like you're banning a person, you're banning an account. And in a world where identity, online identity is virtually meaningless, uh, you know, you haven't punished a person. All you've done is uh, lost audit records as to who the person was. Um, delegate, can you shift the problem to someone else? Uh, in the game space, uh, one of the interesting moves has been to outsource certain security uh, areas, uh, probably most visibly of late, protecting kids. Uh, monitoring services, looking for um, inappropriate activities, uh, people grooming uh, children for child molestation purposes, and people have outsourced that. Now, I think that's great. Or payment processors, actually. You guys outsource your payment processing, and that works. But it only really works if you delegate responsibility as well. Um, and people sometimes don't look at this. Uh, engineers and technical people don't like reading contracts. Uh, but if you actually haven't delegated the responsibility for it as well and the accountability and the liability, you aren't very effective. Uh, insurance, uh, all the poor people who've listened to me today in the side meetings know I love the idea of using security for insurance. I think we could actually do a lot really interesting for security problems in the United States in general by forcing people or businesses to have security insurance. Uh, rewards. We don't have to just punish people, we can reward them. Uh, recovery. Um, this, isn't, uh, this is a general security strategy that people seem to forget, which is uh, because we are so humble, we forget our security systems may not work perfectly forever. Uh, and it is distressing how many wonderful security systems are designed in such a way that if they break, they fail catastrophically. Uh, one might note of recent, the uh, HDMI um, connector problem where they have a uh, keying system in there to make sure that only appropriate people output digital data while that key has been released. Intel is threatening to sue people. Uh, actually, I didn't list suing as a strategy, but it's a legitimate one and has been used by people. Uh, but it's of somewhat limit, limited effectiveness and the, the, the way the HDMI standard was implemented. In fact, there isn't a way to recover. Separate policy from enforcement. Uh, this is kind of, a, this also dates me a bit. There was once upon a time this thing and still is called the Orange Book, which was the 5228, if I'm remembering correctly, which is the security standard. And they talked about two kinds of security standards, the lower one, which were discretionary access controls, and then the higher level ones, which are the mandatory access controls. Um, discretionary access control is kind of what you're used to on your PC with privileges by group and individual. The mandatory ones are structured um, like security clearances, confidential top secret. Now what was interesting to me, I mean, because I had to actually try to use this darn thing, was that I wanted to separate the policy from the enforcement of the policy. And in fact, this one put the lower level policy, the discretionary policy lower, it was a less good policy uh, than the higher kind of security clearance one. But in fact, there are many cases where I want to have a policy, whatever it is, very, perhaps very weak, perhaps very different, enforced very strongly. And we do this a lot. Actually, I found one of my pet peeves with DRM solutions, I, my flip version before my revelation was, if you're going to use a DRM solution, pick the cheapest one that fits your business model. Um, and the reason I, I said that was because the important thing was that it didn't break your business model because a lot of them make 
very specific choices that, about how your business works. And in fact, they may charge you that may drive your business model. So you need to separate policy from enforcement. Asymmetric perceptions of value. I learned about this in college, so college was good for something. Um, uh, Bruce Buena de Mesquita was a visiting guy at Berkeley and uh, had this discussion about uh, military values. It was an international relations course, but it was, he talked about how different people's perception of a problem when they were in conflict could make both parties, in his case, he was talking about World War I, was both parties in World War I thought the mobilization activities that they were taking, be Germany and, and, the, and the Allies, Germany, Austria, and the Allies, were not perceived as high threat. And both of them, so they proceeded to do this because this made them feel better, but they didn't see a risk. Well, the other side perceived the mobilization of the, the other party as a high threat issue. So now you have this huge disconnect between values and perceptions. Um, in the game industry, we have a much more humble ag example, which is gold farming. And here's the case where people are playing these massively multiplayer online games for money. Uh, so they're paying for the privilege because some people have more time than money and they want to trade some money for some time back. So in order to get the 70th level wizard and the sort of coolness, uh, they will buy it from someone. Uh, and from a game industry problem, this is a customer service issue, right? That's how they see it. Uh, people complain about gold farming. So you allocate resources to handle gold farming based upon you know, annoying game balance and customer service issue. From a game gold farmer problem, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. I'm going to spend a lot of resources on it. So guess who wins, right? I've got a terms of service violating <laughs> organization who's highly motivated, making a lot of money versus a company that's making its profit and is only seeing this as I have to hire a couple more customer service reps. So you can guess how the investment will go. And um, we, we see this, I, I, this is one of the reasons I don't like a lot of risk-based security analysis for, 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 um, for, the, uh, for security in general because we make a lot of thoughts about other people's values when we do that. We say, the value of this, to, uh, you know, with the value of this times the risk of this times the value of it to effectively to the other guy determines the risk. Well, if the other guy perceives the value very differently and much, you know, disconnected from you and he perceives high value and you perceive low value, he's going to put a lot of resources into something that you won't invest in at all. And then you're going to have a problem that's bigger than you think. Yes, ma'am. As a non-gamer, this, I'm going to ask you a question. So yes, ma'am. might be more about gaming than security. Sure. But if I'm playing World of Warcraft and I want to be a 70 and therefore I go to a gold farmer to buy whatever I need to do and I'm willing to pay cash, right? This is like I'm willing to pay money for this game status. Awesome. That's what, yeah. that's what that means, right? You are my customer. Okay. Why, who is harmed by that? Um, well, the, the argument is in general that gold farmers aggressively monopolize game resources to gain gold or gain levels or gain items and therefore consume resources that other players would, would not, uh, would be able to play with. Okay. Uh, you can argue, I, I tend to argue most of game fr gold farming is really a problem of game design, but that's kind of beyond the scope of what we can cover here today. No, no, go on. <laughs> Is it clear to other people when I show up with my 70 that I'm not a legitimate? Is that at all? There is a, um, usually in group gameplay, which is often what people want to do when they skip in the World Warcraft case, uh, you've got like the, the, the cool stuff, but you don't know how to drive the car, right? So um, uh, people don't. Be, play very well or skillfully. Now, this isn't always the case. Uh, and then the other problem, which I shouldn't shortchange, is that, uh, of course, since this is a business and you're trying to market to these people, um, a lot of the, uh, the uh, gold farmers will spam communications channels in the game and therefore kind of distract other people from legitimate gameplay or th their gameplay. Um, 
and there are analogs to, in other games. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, unlike the real world, uh, resources in online worlds are not limited. You can throw in as many as you like when you're when you're controlling the game. So. Uh, yep. The argument about um, gold farmers exhausting those resources does not strike me as economically uh, valid. No, they don't exhaust the resources. What they do is they exhaust the real-time consumption of the uh, plate. It's, it's not the resources, it's the access to resources. So if there's the uh, you know naughty monster that drops the Sword of Coolness uh, and that not monster only spawns every 20 minutes for one person, then uh, and the gold farmer is busy, first in line to get into get get into it. It becomes a queuing problem where these guys chew up the, not the uh, resource itself, but the access to the opportunity to get it. So the monster is a resource created by the uh, Hence my discussion that gold farming is a game design problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you are basically agreeing that this was monster. Uh, it is a self-created. Parts of it are self-created problems. Um, they also, they, they, they're, it, it's, uh, I have a chapter in the book on it. It's a big topic. You, could, you can spend, there's a lot of interesting things about gold farming. Uh, frankly, uh, yes. if, I were second, if I were to second guess the uh, game owners, they would want people to play and spend the time and, uh, you know, and money in the game uh, by getting to that 70th layer on their own because it basically takes them more time. They don't have the routine. They don't have you can make an argument about whether it may accelerate people from exiting the game from, uh, yeah. Uh, however, they do all sorts of things that gate content that kind of mitigate that argument. But that sort of gets into the specifics of MMO design that um, I could spend a lot of time going into that, that, that are, it's, it, there are a lot of choice, I mean, like a lot of things, uh, I go back to lazy, which is there's a whole lot of the way MMOs are designed that are because the last MMO was designed that way. Um, uh, for example, actually my, the, the, one of the biggest problems is that uh, for, is of course, gold farmers have to get their gold to their customers or whatever it is. And the way they usually do that is they use the games in-game auction system. Um, and the reason this works so marvelously well is that the in-game auction system, because it's really easy to program, lazy, is to make it work like eBay, where you list individual buy and sell of products and basically, you know, you want to find something, you look for that and you agree to pay the negotiated price or, or whatever. Um, what I have, I've proposed is one of a number of solutions or countermeasures in this area is to go to a sort of stock market type auction uh, sale system where I basically put my buy or sell price in a uh, hidden queue, which is the, you know, the current market prices are shown. Um, I don't know, people play the stock market. It, it works where there's a published buy and sell price and you can put a limit order to buy or sell above or below that. And if you have that, then I can't control who I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't manage my purchase relationship with other players. Um, so that, that can counter that type of problem. The other, the hard type of problem is actually sale of an account because I can't, since my, your identity is defined by username and password, uh, there's no really good way for me to know that it's you behind that username and password when you, when you uh, buy or sell a game. Next security rant. Um, uh, I tend to say uh, security should be simple. If you can't play your security concept in one PowerPoint slide, 16 point or font or grader, not one of those bad PowerPoint slides, to, or to a second grader, so I usually, it's basically I make <coughs> senior executives equivalent to a second grader. It's probably too complicated, um, and again, if it's not simple, it's not secure. I really think this is important, that's why like I say it a couple of times because complexity is usually where we get into security problems. When I talk to anyone in business, and actually I, talk, I think it's even more important talking to people who aspire to or are in the security field, if it doesn't save you money, make you money, keep you out of court, off the front page of the newspaper, unless you wanna be on the front page of the newspaper, uh, or I guess Google or something, don't do it. Um, 
I mean, it, it's time and money are scarce resources. If, if this isn't actually solving a real problem, and I've seen far too many people spend too mu far too much time on security problems that are fascinating in theory, fun technically, and totally meaningless from the business point of view. Um, I, since I'm old enough, I'll say like covert channels used to be a pet bugaboo of mine where people spent a lot of time on covert channel analysis. And I'm not even going to explain that for anyone who doesn't know about it. Look it up. It's a historical artifact. But it's crazy. And um, if a bad guy's on the high side and is going to cause some trouble, he's going to do more interesting things than use covert channels. I like to say he's going to find some big overt channels to get cause problems. OK, we've talked a little bit about this. There's all sorts of interesting parts of this industry. Uh, computer games, online games, uh, gambling, traditional. Um, I, with one of the groups I talked about today, there was a really, um, this past year, there was a really interesting security problem that came up in a casino in Pennsylvania. Now, the uh, slot machines and casinos are a high-tech industry. Uh, they may not strike you as glamorous. Uh, I know they don't strike a lot of people in the game industry as part of the game industry. That's why I, when I talk about supporting the game and gaming industry, it's so I clar clarify the distinction for the two groups. As far as I'm concerned, they're the same. But in the gambling industry, uh, in Pennsylvania out here, there was a, a fascinating case where this guy was uh, arrested for cheating at slots. And how is he doing this? Well, he asked a uh, employee of the company in the VIP lounge to um, alter the game to play it by some specific set of rules. And then when he did this, he did probably some sequence of bets. Uh, there's, it's a little unclear. They, they don't tell you how he did things in detail. But all of a sudden, the game would appear to release a jackpot. Now, if you've ever, has ever been to a casino? Oh, liars. OK. Uh, anyways, in a casino, if you win a, black, uh, a slot jackpot, which I certainly never have, and I only go to them for business, I promise. Um, uh, when you win a, back, a, a, a jackpot, you don't get 5,000 coins dropping out of the uh, uh, slot machine, as you can imagine. Uh, it would be a bit of a problem for you and for the casino. Um, what you do is you get a notification and someone comes over, you know, lights flash, you get a picture taken, and they give you a check. Now, the security systems in the slot machines record pay-ins and pay-outs, but, but if you're not a very sophisticated casino, the slot, the, they, it can't reconcile jackpots because the jackpot isn't paid out of the money in the, in the <coughs> slot machine. So what these bad guys had done is they'd modified the software in the, in, the, in the slot machine so that it would appear to award a jackpot. Now, the math didn't award a jackpot. The log didn't report a jackpot. It just reported line jackpot. So, but the bells went off and the whistles, and that's not the part of code that the IV and V guys look at, so this is good. And so you get a jackpot and you go home. Well, these guys weren't really sharp. <laughs> and they did this repeatedly. And they basically threw things off, the, the balance off, because you, you know, the, there's too much going on for the things to balance perfectly. So that the numbers were big enough that they got picked up by both the gaming control board, I think, and the, um, and the casino. Uh, and they got arrested, and fun ensued. Now you're going, oh, that's kind of an interesting story, Steve. Why are you spending so much time on it? I said, like, I'm spending so much time on it because this guy wasn't a casino software company employee. He was, I think, three steps above a derelict. I mean, you know, he was kind of some guy. And it, you know, so my guess is he'd probably been part of a cheat team uh, probably when he lived in Las Vegas and heard about this, this problem. And just when he went to Pennsylvania, which is a relatively new slot jurisdiction, uh, basically just asked for this to, to go on. Well, all casino software is IV, all slot machine software is pretty seriously evaluated by gaming control boards. And I'm sure Pennsylvania probably picked a slot machine major manufacturer that was probably approved in Las Vegas and, and New Jersey. And I've talked to these guys. They are really serious about doing this. 
but in a modern um, uh, slot machine, there are hundreds of thousands of lines of code. If you've ever seen one of these things, they're very fancy, elaborate graphics, animation stuff. Well, you can't look at that many lines of code and actually find anything of interest. Um, uh, even if there's malice in there. Uh, we did some studies at NSA on this. It's, it's, it's just, it's futile. If you've got someone highly motivated, they will get in there. As we were talking earlier, did they evaluate the uh, compiler? Who knows? But, so my guess is there is some one or group of people at a major slot machine manufacturer who at, you know, at some point in the past, and in probably in many machines, modified, got the software into the system and modified it. And it was, it, of course, it's not in the high value, you, you know, cause this isn't actually modifying the uh, casino logic side of the code. This is just putting up an image that says you won. So it probably wasn't the part of the code that was really closely looked at. This is good. Um, and so this is probably out there and, and I don't know if it's still out there in many machines. And I would guess probably I'd be really looking closely at every machine from an, that slot manufacturer. Uh, because these guys, you know, these guys were, arrested for like creating this cheat and stuff. I'm like, they just used it. They didn't, they didn't know it. <laughs> they sure didn't put it in there. They have no access to the software on these machines. Installing software on these machines is very tightly controlled. Um, uh, it's kind of, as an old NSA guy, it reminds me of how people handle crypto boxes at NSA. Um, so they didn't do anything clever except use something that they stumbled into. Uh, and that's an interesting security problem. I, you know, um, it's not quite as, I don't know, I think it's kind of more sexy than cheating at an online game because it made a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, there was a similar case actually online where uh, this actually, I think it made it to 60 Minutes last year uh, where some guy at the online poker software company took advantage of a back door that allowed him to see all the hole, hole cards in online poker. He was doing really well. Uh, he was doing so well and gloating about it that eventually people got suspicious. Um, stupid kicks in, perhaps, uh, in this case, and he got caught. Um, so anyways, there's a lot of things going on in, in, in the game space. Um, uh, security problems, because uh, I live in the Bay Area, I get to hear all this Silicon Valley stuff, and there's this new thing called gamification. I don't know if you've heard this idea, which is applying game techniques to uh, non-game areas, uh, getting kids to do their homework or eat their peas, I guess. Um, as a security guy, I look at this as a ripe opportunity for abuse. Uh, people do actually uh, abuse ranking and, and other systems in, in uh, eBay. I mean, all the, there are all these closely related mechanisms, uh, ranking systems that were started for games have been used for uh, auction houses for social networks for creating any sort of ranking systems. And if there's any incentive, either personal or financial, people will exploit them. Uh, so it's a big business and a lot of really interesting problems. Um, also, there's a lot of data. Uh, actually, I'll come to that. There's a huge amount of data in this industry. Uh, not because the industry wants it to be there, but because unlike when you rob a bank as a cyber crook and don't tell anyone because it's a bad idea. Cheaters and hackers in games and pirates brag and post and brag and post and the industry has to sort of acknowledge that and it's part of the bread and butter of, of the field. So you get a huge amount of data that you, you wouldn't get in any other field which to me makes it a great target for research. Uh, the companies have to be a little less reluctant at least conceptually to disclosing data because you can go well, I can pull it down from, you know, Steve's blog, if nothing else. Um, but there's, there, there's just a lot of data. The uh, discussions get fascinatingly technical if you're interested in how people exploit things. Um, remember, the stakes here are very low. In most of these games, most of the time, people are not spending, this, this is not for a lot of money. Uh, when I first gave my first presentation on game security at Game Developer Conference in 2001, 2002, uh, people were saying, yeah, people cheat to get a high score at a flash game on some random website. Uh, people's egos are very fragile and they're, they enjoy their little rewards and they're, it's amazing how motivated people are for little things. Uh, in the game industry and in general, I talk about six, uh, seven figure security. 
If there isn't at least a million dollars involved, don't worry about it. Um, fraud, personal information disclosure, you can get zapped by the uh, government for that. Uh, COPPA, um, that's the Child Online Privacy and Protection Act, not to be confused with the COPPA, Child Online Protection <laughs> Act, uh, which does not hold up, uh, hasn't held up in court. But uh, you can be sued for a million dollars for COPPA violation. Several people have and had to pay up. Uh, piracy, in-game fraud and scams. Um, Sony, the uh, Sony Online Entertainment with EverQuest 2 a couple years ago did this fascinating experiment where they um, actually, to fight gold farming, um, uh, allowed through this thing called Station Exchange the online purchase and sale of goods for money. And it cut their customer service on those servers by like 48%. And I, when I heard that, I said, to me, this you know, sells changing the idea. It, uh, to go back to another problem with gold farming is it creates a lot of customer service problems because there's a lot of fraud in gold farming or, and the purchase and sale of these items. And actually, simply by, even if they provided the service for free, not making any cut of action on this, um, they cut their, uh, their, their uh, customer support costs. Now, they ran into some other problems because they weren't controlling uh, the people and they started having uh, credit card fraud because fr people were using their legitimate sales system with illegitimate things so that was purchase fraud but that's a different problem. Um, actually a good tribute to this is that uh, Eve Online who I was talking about this afternoon sometime, a uh, science fiction game, uh, created a convertible currency called uh, Plex that would allow you to convert uh, game currency into to subscription time. It's a subscription game. And I believe, and they said this was a, a, a measure to stop gold farming or fight gold farming. Uh, banning, cheating. Uh, banning people costs money. Uh, <laughs> I know this may be an odd thing to have to say, but um, it costs you something to ban people from a game. If they're a subscriber to an MMO, you know, that's $12 a month. Um, I always read with some concern, excuse me. Well, not too much concern because I don't have stock in Microsoft, but they ban people regularly from Xbox Lives for misbehaving. Um, and I'm like, okay, it's a console, and these people probably buy a lot of games, you know, unless they stole the game, but even then. So if I'm banned from Xbox Live, am I going to buy the next Xbox? Probably not. So that's couple hundred dollars. Uh, how many future games am I going to buy from Microsoft? Probably very few. Yes? So actually, uh, people Absolutely, because identity is weak. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're not giving Microsoft more money. They're, they, they buy another used one, and then the, and then actually they create a customer service problem because they sell that banned Xbox on eBay, <laughs> uh, which then someone else buys and tries to connect to, 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 to Xbox, and then they say, well, you're banned, and that becomes a, customer, a different customer support problem. Uh, well, but if I, again, it, 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 create, it creates a, a cost for Microsoft. It, does, it is not a revenue opportunity for Microsoft, particularly. Uh, and one can argue about how many, you know, again, am I more like, even if I get banned, I go, well, should I buy another Xbox or should I get a PlayStation 3? I, I, it's an, and it's an opportunity to make a different decision. How many games am I going to buy? Uh, and then proprietary discla data disclosure. I put in... I'd like to get a two to one ROI for this. I sat and did this in front of an executive from a game company and he said he wanted that to be five for one. Just to show you the enthusiasm with which, I was like, man, does any part, other part of your business have to earn, earn back five bucks per dollar expenditure? Because I know your games don't. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, that's the kind of numbers they're looking for. Uh, I'm big into a lot of transactions. It's, uh, security systems largely as, as systems work by meshing you in the environment and, and having a on, ongoing transactions. As we were discussing here with the, the Xbox, 
uh, Xbox Live, I have an ongoing account relationship with Microsoft. I have my gamer tag and, relation, and, and achievements and all these other things that they've built into the social network uh, on top of, of Xbox Live. Um, uh, MMOs, you know, I, I've, I have all this, the, the loot either I bought or, or earned. Uh, the more transactions, the more enmeshed I am in the system. Games and systems that are particularly vulnerable to attack are things that don't have uh, an ongoing relationship. If I can unwind identity and get myself back into the game, I have less motive to be honest because I, can re I know I can get back in and get whatever I want. Um, I was, uh, was it a week or two ago? I was, I was at a, a game company and they were telling me they were having a big chargeback jump in, in, in an online game. And this online game doesn't have a, a lot of persistence, you know, in terms of levels or other things. You just kind of play. And uh, I said, well, what was the problem? Uh, and they said, well, you know, we just have this big jumping credit card things, but we don't understand it. There's no gold farming in this. There's no way to monetize this. And I said, did you change anything else? And they said, well, we started offering uh, 50 and $100 um, uh, purchases as opposed to maxing out at $20. And I said, oh, okay, well, it's credit card fraud. These guys are selling accounts. Because the individual account has limit, limited value, in other words, if I you know, play the game, buy my stuff, and then get banned or lose or whatever, there's just limited persistence. There's li limited change in my value to my account, my persona, whatever it is online. It makes it much easier for me to be willing to basically consume disposable accounts because I have no ongoing commitment to the community. Um, let's use a ridiculous example. If I, since I'm just visiting here, if I drove around and got all sort in a car accident and shot a bunch of people and left and never came back to New Hampshire again, unless you knew who I was with a fair amount of accuracy, I'd get away with it. Why? Because I haven't re I'm not going to re-enter the system and my risks are low. Right? People run away to other countries. Join the Foreign Legion when you get, get in trouble. Um, if, you, if you can break down that, that ongoing relationship, an awful lot of security mechanisms uh, fail, uh, particularly recovery mechanisms. So as a designer of systems for games or anything else, I want to enmesh people deeply in my systems. I want them to have a long-term vested relationship with me, uh, which is why, actually, I argue strongly against ban banning. Uh, we're running pretty well into time. I can keep rambling along or, or whatever. Or do you want to know what Madonna versus one dollar is? Probably have to explain that and then I, okay. Um, for a long time I've given this, the presentation and tried to explain the, the piracy issue. And I was trying to explain the difference between Madonna or a piece of Madonna's music and one dollar. And the value of the way I used to put this, was with, with a, the value of having a Madonna song was in its possession. Uh, that, that is where the value of that comes from. You know, I have this CD or MP3 or whatever. Uh, the value of having a dollar comes from my ability to exercise it in a future transaction, right? A dollar isn't, really, isn't worth the, the value of a dollar is on the outgoing side to me in some sense. Um, you know, if we were to pass a dollar around, a bill around the room, um, you'd expect a dollar in return, <laughs> uh, unless we're much better friends than we all are. Um, so the, 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 the security incentives for looking for fraud, because I, I, always talk, I use this when I talk about piracy, is that if you look at a dollar bill, it has all these great security indicators that we know, right? You can look, you see the little line, and you see the watermark and all this stuff. Okay, I have a vested interest in the legitimacy of this, in this case, a $10 bill. Um, so when I receive one, I care that it is legitimate because I am entertaining a transaction that's worth $10 to me that I get $10 for. This is very different than the transaction when I get a copy of music. And this is why music piracy, using people compare counterfeiting music to counterfeiting money. And it isn't. The relationship is fundamentally different. 
Um, when I get a copy of a piece of Madonna music, the only thing I care about is the quality of the report recording. Uh, and that's, that's the essential difference. Actually, let's me, ah, there we go. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna end on the, this slide because it's fun. So, what do Nine Inch Nails, Disney in China, and Photoshop have in common? They have kind of radically interesting views on piracy. Nine Inch Nails, uh, who I've never listened to, um, I understand people like them, uh, did a really interesting thing with one of their recent albums. They uh, sold a super high level version of, one, of it for like 200 bucks. And then, and then, you know, sort of had all these alternate tracks, additional features, all the way down to a very, very cheap version. And, uh, you know, the answer was this was a way to fight piracy and also allow people, you know, low-end customers to buy the product at a very low-end price, lower than the, the usual music store prices. Um, the use of dynamic pricing and collector's versions is something that the game industry doesn't really take seriously. And... In, the, in a world of virtual and digital goods, it's like, okay, as we were saying before, you know, making a copy of a monster or a sword costs you nothing. Well, you know, for most digital goods, even music, making a copy costs me next to nothing. Um, when a game company sells you a collector's edition that has a miniature in it, I can guarantee, you, you know, or a map, it's not costing them anywhere near the extra 10 to 20 to $30 or more they've, they've added to the price. Um, Disney in China is actually an inter one of the more interesting conventional anti-piracy strategies I've seen. As you would guess, counterfeit goods are a problem in China for everybody. The way Disney fought this was they, want, they got the consumer on their side. And I cite this because I think it's just a cool example. How did they do it? They put little Disney holographic pictures on all of their official goods and then turned around and said, uh, if you buy one of our goods, you know, uh, cut this proof of purchase thing off and send it in and, uh, you know, and your name and you can win a trip to Disneyland or something. Totally brilliant from a counterfeiting fighting point of view. First of all, as a first order basis, these, you, you've now made every consumer vest, has a vested interest in the legitimacy of the item they're purchasing because they want the trip to Disneyland. It doesn't matter actually how unlikely they are to win the trip to Disneyland. Uh, it, uh, if you look at contests and promotions, uh, it is totally depressing how willing people are to part with personal information for the odd chance of winning some random item. Um, I have been offered so many MP3 players and uh, iPads and stuff for uh, filling out questionnaires. It is totally disturbing. So it's a great low cost both marketing solution and as a security guy I never have any money so I like getting other people to pay for it. Uh, and if anyone submits one of these that's actually been successfully counterfeited to the point where they didn't recognize it, I now have a, a wealth of useful information. I have a person with a name and address who I can go, well thanks for your entry and you did, here's a prize, <laughs> but could you tell me where you purchased that item? because we're gonna go have a talk with them. <laughs> so now I've, I've turned my consumers into my uh, uh, informants on, on counterfeiters. We can do strategic things for security. Um, conversely, and I have heard this, and this is an allegation, but I love it, which is Photoshop does not care at all about piracy, or cares very little about it. The reason they don't care about piracy is because what they really care about is a competing product. And what they know is that if I can get a pirated version of Photoshop, I might eventually buy a legitimate version. But what they really know is that a free pirated version of Photoshop kills Photoshop competitors dead. So in some sense, and I don't know if this is true, but it makes a wonderful story, Photoshop is in some sense using piracy of their own good as a competitive tool. Perhaps, I'm not, Confirming that or denying it, I have no official knowledge, but it makes a great story and an interesting uh, strat strategic thought for people. Thank you very, uh, very much. I'm here to answer questions. I have some business cards if someone would like to get in touch with me later. Uh, and thank you all. <laughs>